Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In the human story, the Pleistocene Holocene transition is a very significant time period because it marks what I believe are the foundations for the origins of civilization. When we see the first permanent settlements in the Fertile Crescent, followed closely by the onset of agriculture, and from then on, humanity has developed exponentially. From an archaeological point of view, it's truly a fascinating time period, with so many incredible sites discovered in the past century, from ancient Jericho in the West Bank, to Merebet and Tel Caramel in Syria, and Kortik Tepe, Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe in Turkey. The foundations of these sites were laid either just before, during or after the Younger Dryas, the time when temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere plunged, which, according to the platinum spike in the Greenland ice core data, began around 12,822 years ago, and many parts of the world returned to glacial or near-glacial conditions, a changing climate that lasted around 1,000 years. Before the Younger Dryas, between 14,670 and 12,890 years ago, Greenland ice core data shows that the Northern Hemisphere was experiencing the Bolling Alarod Late Glacial Interstadial. The period began with a sharp rise in temperature, but over the 2,000 years that followed, although temperatures remained comparatively warm, the general climatic trend was decline. This all came to a head with the onset of the Younger Dryas, where various data sets show a somewhat dramatic drop in temperature, by 4 to 10 degrees Celsius depending on where you lived. And that is an important point, because not every part of the planet was affected in the same way. In Western Europe and Greenland, the Younger Dryas is a well-defined and synchronous cold period. South America had a less well-defined initiation, but it did have a sharp termination. Australia and New Zealand were seemingly unaffected, but interestingly, around 100 years or so before the onset of the Younger Dryas, as recorded in the Greenland data, Antarctic ice core data shows the opposite trend, and the southern polar regions began to warm up. With this in mind, with my personal interest in the pre-pottery Neolithic, I really wanted to know what was happening in the Fertile Crescent. How did the Younger Dryas affect the climate from Anatolia to the Levant, the area which really is the true cradle of civilization? Well, for obvious reasons, we can't obtain ice core data from Turkey, Israel or Syria. And so we learn about the Younger Dryas in a number of different ways. Firstly, we can analyse the types of pollen, which gives us a good idea of what was growing in the region. The types of plants and trees do give a good indication of climate. We also have animal bones in the sedimentary record, so we know which animals were present, dominant, dwindling or absent, and we can chart this across the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. Again, this is a good indication for the climate to understand the environmental conditions and habitats. We can also analyse marine records and take a look at paleo lake levels to see just how charged the natural lakes and reservoirs were, and this gives us a good idea of how wet or dry the region was, and if and when things changed. We can also study the sedimentary deposits themselves, and also speleothems. These are the mineral deposits formed from groundwater in underground caves, deposits like stalagmites and stalactites. So, with this in mind, what was it like in the Fertile Crescent during the Younger Dryas? What have we learned? Well, actually a huge amount and the analysis has turned what I thought I knew about the Younger Dryas on its head. Of course, the Younger Dryas is when many researchers proposed there was a global cataclysm, and a number of high-profile scientists, authors, podcasters and YouTubers believe there is enough evidence to suggest a series of cosmic impacts or air bursts struck the Earth. 
Others believe there was a major plasma discharge from the Sun, and many speculate there was also a corresponding global Great Flood. But does the evidence and the data fit the catastrophic model? What can we learn about the onset of the Younger Dryas in the Fertile Crescent? In 2013, Donald O. Henry wrote a fantastic summary called The Natufian and the Younger Dryas, where he collates all the data from decades of work, and from this we can see the bigger picture. There have been many excavations of epi-Paleolithic and pre-pottery Neolithic sites in the Levant, as well as numerous paleoclimatic studies, and we do have a large amount of data to work with. For a start, and to clear up the age-old misconceptions and outlandish claims, there is absolutely no evidence for any kind of Great Flood or mega tsunami that covered the Fertile Crescent at the beginning or end of the Younger Dryas. We do have a very good understanding of what the environment was like. The best place to start is speleothems, cave deposits. There are a number of cave sites that have been analysed in Lebanon and Israel, and we can measure oxygen and carbon isotope ratios in deposits. These are datable, and they do give us a good indication of what the climate was like, in a very similar way to ice cores. From analysing speleothems from sites including the Sorek Cave in Israel, several caves in Galilee, and the Gita Cave in Lebanon, the regional timing of the Younger Dryas has been carefully documented and averaged. Interestingly, we see the climate becoming colder and drier from 14,000 years ago, and using isotopes in speleothems, the true onset of the Younger Dryas in this part of the world has been dated between 13,000 and 13,200 years ago, which is earlier than expected, and it ended between 11,200 and 11,400 years ago, which is later than expected. Therefore, the Younger Dryas climate in the Fertile Crescent does differ to what we see in the Greenland ice core data, both in terms of dating and duration. Speleothem dating therefore calls into question a cataclysmic origin for the Younger Dryas which, if it did happen, would have led to a coherent cooling signature in deposits around the world. They should not be staggered. We also see a similar thing with Antarctic ice core data, which also shows a drastic change in temperature a few hundred years before Greenland. I'll discuss this further in a future video. In the Levant, the Younger Dryas lasted for 1,800 to 2,000 years, and that's in contrast to the 1,200 to 1,300 years in Greenland. The beginning was more gradual compared to Greenland, and speleothem evidence suggests that the termination of the Younger Dryas in the Levant was also a much slower process, taking some 500 years to move out of the cold and dry conditions. The same is seen in the Dong Cave records in China. The start and end of the Younger Dryas are not as abrupt as we see in the Greenland ice cores. The pollen studies in Lake Gab in Syria and Lake Hule in Israel don't give us specific dates like speleothems do, but it does give us an indication of the changing landscape. For example, during the Younger Dryas, the forests of Syria sharply declined and were replaced by arid tolerant shrubs. In the southern Levant, the forests were also replaced, but by open grassland interspersed with patches of oak pistachio woodland. The dry conditions are confirmed by studying the levels of the ancient Lizan Lake in the Jordan Rift Valley. Scientists have noted it doesn't dramatically drop at the start of the Younger Dryas as you would expect, but we actually see a gradual fall. For example, 25,000 years ago, the lake level was at its highest at 164 metres below sea level. 15,000 years ago, its level had fallen to 300 metres below sea level, and at the beginning of the Younger Dryas around 13,200 years ago, the lake level was at 426 metres below sea level. The Bolling Alarod may have been a wetter and warmer period, but it was certainly a period of decline, 
and we do see this in the Greenland ice core data as well. So, it looks like the Younger Dryas had a somewhat gradual beginning, as opposed to being cataclysmic, and this is confirmed with geomorphic evidence as well. Between 17,500 and 15,000 years ago, we find that the wet conditions and the high water table led to the cutting of new channels across the landscape, leaving substantial alluvial deposits in the sedimentary record. But by 14,000 years ago, 1,000 years before the Younger Dryas was in full swing, this had already come to an end. There was no overbank flooding, and the channels became narrower. The environment was already becoming drier, and again, we see that the lowering of the water table was gradual and not sudden. So, although this is a brief overview, the evidence suggests the Younger Dryas began between 13,200 and 13,000 years ago, and it ended between 11,200 and 11,400 years ago, and that's from multiple studies across numerous sites in the Levant. It was a cold and dry period, with low lake levels and also a change in vegetation. The regional Levantine expression of the Younger Dryas differs in terms of duration, strength and tempo of termination compared to the North Atlantic. It started earlier and ended later than what we see in the Greenland ice cores, and the changing climate at the start and the end was slower and more gradual, with the termination stretching over hundreds of years. The changes to the landscape were also not as drastic as we're led to believe, and the human populations were not have viewed it as cataclysmic. Further, paleoclimatic work has showed that the changing climate was even less dramatic in the southern Levant compared to the north. As far as we know, the beginning of the Younger Dryas also did not lead to any kind of cultural shifts as well. The late Natufian cultural phase is dated to 13,700 to 11,000 years ago, so beginning hundreds of years before the Younger Dryas and running right up to the start of the Holocene. The culture's origins and demise were not driven by the Younger Dryas. They would have experienced the climate changes gradually, and they would have adapted accordingly over many generations. When the climate got worse, there is evidence that some population groups did go mobile, but a number of permanent settlements remained throughout the cold and dry period, and some new ones even emerged like Abu Huraira and Merebet. The move to sedentism and permanent settlements was likely driven by the changing climate, and then on to the development of agricultural practices. Vegetation was changing. Rainfall was becoming less frequent, and so people banded together. As key wild plant staples were diminishing, the cultivation of wild crops was probably a way to plan ahead, to create a surplus to put in storage, to guarantee enough food for the cold winters. But during the Younger Dryas, there are indications that the levels of precipitation never fell below critical. It wasn't too dry and cultivation was possible. The main problem was the cold temperatures, and so storing food was probably a necessity. A huge amount of work has been done at the now submerged site of Abu Huraira, which pretty much shows continuous occupation from around 13,200 to 11,400 years ago spanning the long drawn out Levantine Younger Dryas, as dated by Espeleothem deposits. This site shows some of the earliest evidence of agriculture in the Fertile Crescent. Away from the Levant and into southeastern Anatolia, and a great deal of paleoclimatic work has been done at the Younger Dryas early Holocene boundary site of Cortic Tepe a site that had continuous occupation from around 12,400 to 11,250 years ago, another site with origins in the Younger Dryas. By all accounts, the people of Cortic Tepe did not struggle as much as we'd think. We know from the animal and plant remains that they did exploit many types of local ecozones, wetlands, grasslands, mountainous habitats, and so on. 
red deer and wild sheep were in abundance throughout and they were a common source of food during the Younger Dryas and throughout the transition into the Holocene. The animal remains at Cortic Tepe also tell us about the climate. In the early to mid-life of the settlement, there is a notable lack of oryx, wild boar and water birds. Being animals attracted to wetlands, their absence does indicate dry conditions. But, in time, when the climate became wetter in the transition to the early Holocene, such animals did arrive and were hunted. And this marries up with what we know happened at the time. There was a gradual increase in marshland around lakes, rivers and streams. So, that's a brief overview of life in the Younger Dryas in the Fertile Crescent, but there is one specific topic I do need to mention because it made the news back in 2020 and it concerns the Natufian site of Abu Huraira in Syria. In 2020, scientific reports ran the article Evidence of Cosmic Impact at Abu Huraira in Syria at the Younger Dryas onset around 12,800 years ago. High temperature melting at greater than 2,200 degrees Celsius. Due to the complexity of the study and the importance of the conclusions, and because I have a number of questions I'm struggling to find answers for, I'm going to discuss this in a separate forthcoming video. For example, Speleothem data places the origins of the Younger Dryas between 100 and 300 years earlier than the date given for the proposed cosmic impact at Abu Huraira. Furthermore, in a new 2022 paper co-written by Andrew Moore, who also co-wrote the 2020 paper for evidence of a cosmic impact and high temperature melting, he says there are three sub-phases in the first settlement of Abu Huraira. The first from 13,300 to 12,800 years ago. The second from 12,800 to 12,300 years ago. And the third from 12,300 to 11,400 years ago. So, if the area was hit by a cosmic impact or airburst, which generated temperatures of up to 2,200 degrees Celsius, would Phase 1b really have started pretty much straight away? Wouldn't there have been a substantial gap in settlement? Wouldn't the people, animals and vegetation all have been fried? Would it not have become an uninhabitable wasteland for decades? Would people really have come back and built a brand new settlement directly over the one that was destroyed by high temperature melting? Calibration of all the radiocarbon dates from the first settlement pretty much show continuous occupation from 13,300 to 11,400 years ago. So I do wonder if the evidence for a cosmic impact does have another interpretation or whether the study really needs to be independently verified by a new team with fresh samples. The first phase of the first settlement at Abu Huraira dates to the beginning of the Younger Dryas in this region, as shown by Speleothem data. And this for me does make sense. It explains the sudden move to sedentism between roughly 13,000 and 13,300 years ago, and so a 12,800 year old settlement destroying impact event followed by a somewhat immediate resettlement does seem bizarre. The whole impact event at Abu Huraira is an anomaly. It doesn't seem to fit with what we know about the Younger Dryas in this region. There is a large gap in occupation at Abu Huraira, but this was between 11,400 and 10,600 years ago, which separates the end of the first major settlement and the beginning of the second. As you can see, I do have a lot of questions, there is a lot of data and reading to work through, but hopefully it will all become clearer very soon. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.